All right, guys, so welcome back to the second edition of In the First Shed. Uh, man, I got to tell you, the first one was just a complete, complete success. Uh, you know, really, uh, really a good turnout here. And, uh, you know, you guys commenting and sharing and sharing your knowledge in the comments. And, you know, it was just a really, uh, really a good start. I think this is really going to be something that's going to last for a while. Uh, so anyway, I just wanted to, uh, we're just going to get right into it here. This week, uh, there was so many comments and so many questions and everything else that I just wanted to, uh, I just want to kind of get in with it. If your question wasn't, uh, isn't going to be answered this week, please don't get discouraged. I had so many questions and so many comments that I know there's no way I can get to them all. Uh, and also, a lot of you guys had good enough questions that I think I'm going to dedicate a whole video to it, you know, rather than just answer them, you know, uh, here in this Q&A. So anyway... Uh, we're just going to get started here, and I'm just going to kind of go down through the list of, of what I what I chose for today's discussion, and uh, and we'll just have a good chat here. So, first question: uh, getting started. Getting started. A lot of people, you know, new to this sport, getting started. Uh, you know, what do they need as far as uh, equipment, traps, wh whatever. If it's your first year and you want to dedicate yourself just to the trapping aspect of it and kind of leave out the fur handling, uh, you know, that's fine. I myself, I really enjoy the fur handling uh, as much, if not more, than the trapping aspect of it. To come here in the shed and kind of wind down in the night and, and do up the fur, you know, it just, I find that to be very satisfying. So, you know, consider that whenever you're getting into it. Everybody says, you know, don't buy cheap on the traps, but at the same time, you got to have the traps to run, to catch the fur, to put up the fur. So, in my honest opinion, uh, you know, buy what you can afford, and in this particular instance, you know, the more traps are, are better. And I'm just going to put this into a class. Say, a class of the MBs versus Dukes. Uh, you know, there's a substantial difference in those two traps. Uh, there's there's a pretty good significant difference in price also uh, you know is it worth it for the guy starting out I personally don't think so if he's on a budget you got to remember this trapping game is a sport that will actually pay for itself in the long run so if you're new to it my my suggestion is you know go out and buy you a, you know a dozen Duke one and a halves or uh, a dozen bridgers or something. Buy what you can afford. The more traps in the ground are the better in, in this instance. As the years progress, you sell a little bit of fur, you find out you really like the sport, well then you can upgrade. Uh, and that being said, if you're a kind of guy that likes to tinker, then you know you can always take the Dukes and you can kind of get them up to par on say like the MBs or, or the other style of traps. You know, you, you can always tinker with the stuff and just kind of modify it. So in my opinion, with the traps, you know, more is better in that application. Now, let's flip over and we'll go to the fur handling aspect of it. If you're going to get into fur handling, definitely buy quality. Uh, you know, I'm guilty. My first fleshing knife was the cheap little $9 one, and I regretted it the minute I tried to use it. Uh, so, in, in the fur shed, I feel like, especially with fleshing, uh, your fleshing knives because I mean that's the majority your boards you can work into if you're a wire guy you know that's a one-time buy kind of thing but definitely with a fleshing knife buy a good quality fleshing knife now, I've got I've got several fleshing knives uh, you know I've done videos in the past I may do some more in the future but you know a good portion of them are all on the same quality and the biggest thing with a fleshing knife is it's what you get used to uh, you know, I feel like steel is a big part of it. The quality of the steel is a big part of a flushing knife. But at the same time, it's what you get used to and feel comfortable with. So, uh, you know, maybe a guy, he does good with a machete or a lawnmower blade. But at the same time, I, I just feel like you're... Your money ahead to put the money into a good quality flushing knives, as we discussed in the last video, skinning knives, you know, that's a couple bucks. But, uh, you know, that's just kind of my... My outlook on the getting started, uh, you know, I'll be honest, whenever I first started, uh, my first traps actually came from an antique shop. Uh, you know, I was young and I didn't really know that there were supply houses and everything else and I'm sure I way overpaid for them, I can't remember, but I know I remember going to uh, the antique shops around and picking through the old, the old barrels of, uh, 
of junk traps that they called antiques, you know, so you got that price added on to it. All right, uh, another question that came up a lot, and I'm, I'll just answer, what critter do I hate skinning the most? Uh, hands down, uh, coyotes. Coyotes are my least favorite critter to handle, and it's very simple. Once you guys start doing this kind of stuff, you'll easily, you'll very quickly learn that the critters with the most amount of fat on them are the easiest to skin. Uh, you, I, many of you have probably skinned a squirrel. Squirrel's hide just sticks to him. Same way as a coyote because they have a very small amount of fat. Uh, a coon or a beaver or a skunk, uh, you know, have very, very high quantities of fat on them. You could just peel them right down. So uh, definitely, definitely the coyote. Now we're going to move on. Lots of people have questions about skunks. I usually don't talk this much. A lot of people have questions on skunks. Now, I'm just going to come out and say it. Skunks stink. That's a whatever. You know, you can kind of get used to the smell, but there will always be a skunky smell. If you cannot get over that, you do not need to be in this game of trapping. Uh, you know, yes, there are things that can kind of mitigate the smell and things that you can do to help mitigate the smell, but plain and simple, skunks stink. Uh, and there's not a lot that you can do about it, per se, to get rid of the stink completely. Uh, now, I will say, I see a lot of guys, and I mean, if they get a skunk, they're putting this sucker through the, through the dry cleaning regimen with peroxides and soaps and all this other stuff. I personally, I don't believe any of that. If I get a skunk, he comes home, he gets washed in water, that takes 90% of the smell off of him, and he's on his way down the road. Uh, I'm not going to take the time out of my day to mix up a, you know, a concoction, a witch's brew, if you would, of uh, of all these ingredients. You just kind of got it's one of them things you got to get used to. Uh, as far as dispatch, you know, a lot of a lot of theories out there as far as dispatch. I myself have went through. You know, if you dispatch a skunk uh, in the in the chest, like a heart lung shot, versus in the head, uh, he won't spray. Now I'm here to tell you. Uh, if you dispatch in the head with a skunk, he's going to spray, you know, eight, nine times out of ten. Uh, will it be the full load? Not always, but he's definitely going to spray. Will you, if you dispatch in the heart-lung area, you've got a better chance that the skunk is not going to spray, but I'm here to tell you that they're still going to spray. It's not 100%, uh, you know, that if you shoot them heart-lungs that that the skunk's not gonna spray. You're gonna get the odd one that's gonna spray. I'd say, if I had to guess, I'm, from my experience, maybe maybe two out of five are gonna spray. So, I mean, the ratio is a little bit better, but then you've got to understand, skunks are small, and the heart-lung region that you're gonna be aiming at is very, very small. You also have to remember that skunks are sold fur in. So, if you can't get that heart lung shot in the first couple, you're going to end up putting holes in that hide. So you got to kind of weigh out the uh, you know the odds there. A lot of questions about uh, selling green and ways to freeze and, and different things like that. So I'm going to go into that real quick. So plain and simple, for those of you who don't know, selling green is basically if you sell the hide that has been skinned, it's off the carcass, and it's not fleshed. Selling a whole is obviously selling the whole critter that's not been skinned. And selling finished fur is fur that has been skinned and fleshed and dried. A lot of people sell green simply because they don't want to go through all this work of fleshing and stretching and, you know, boarding and all that. A lot of guys sell green. Now, if you're going to sell green, there's a couple ways to, to help you out. Uh, first off here, you're going to naturally have to freeze the stuff. Um, because you, you know you want to get a big quantity, go to the buyer all at one shot. There's a proper way to freeze green fur, and I'm going to kind of show you on a coon here. I've got a I've got a coon hide here. Now, the best way to do this, because you have to remember, you're going to have to have this sucker thawed out to get your best presentation uh, whenever you take him to the sale. So we've got a, a skinned a skinned coon hide here. Now. Depending on how long you leave them in the freezer, you may have to, you may want to kind of similarly address the freezer burn issues. It's usually not that big of a deal because you've got a, a very insulative critter here, and you're normally not going to leave them in the freezer for more than you know a couple of 
couple of months at max, basically. So the best way to do this is is you take your hide, and what you want to do is you want, if it has a tail, I'll try to get it in frame. If it has a tail, you want to put the tail into the belly, and then you want to you want to roll him up, get his feet in there. If he's got got legs, get the legs in there, and you roll him up like a ball. And what you're going to end up with, it looks like the top of a coonskin cap, basically. So we've got the head being on the outside. Okay? Just like that. Now, what this does is, you have to remember, in the fur trade, the, the area from the head down to the neck has no value. So if this part was to get freezer burned, not an issue at all. Second thing is... About a day or two before you go sell your green fur, you need to take it out of the freezer and you need to thaw it. Now, depending on the temperatures that you're in, uh, you know, selling this and, and having this, this preparation time really helps you by having the head on the outside. Because all you have to do is take what's already on the outside. Remember, this thing's going to be a block. It's going to be a, a solid frozen block. All you have to do is take this nose and hang it. And then over time over the course of a day or so, as this coon thaws out, he's going to just roll out and you're going to get an even thaw without having temperatures affect the rest of the hide. Then you can take him to the buyer, he can look at it, he'll give you a price, and you can sell. That's, that's the best way. So, just to kind of recap here, take the tail, fold it in, roll your coon up. I personally like, if you're going to do it, um, put them in uh, individual Walmart bags. And you have to remember whenever you freeze them, because these suckers, it takes so long to freeze them because they're fur, you know, you want to kind of layer them in your freezer and make sure that, you know, that freezes don't pile a whole bunch in. So, you know, that's selling green. I get a lot of questions on that, how to do that. That's the proper, proper way to do that. One final question here, and this is on carcass disposal. I get so many questions on carcass disposal. Uh, now, this is again very situational, but let me tell you my views on it. Plain and simple, guys, uh, I, I feel like I use a good part of the carcasses that I go through. Um, my big thing is I eat a lot of the stuff too. Um, if, if any of you guys have never never tried, uh, tried to eat the beavers and the muskrats, you're, very, you're missing out on what is a very excellent kind of meat. Uh, you've, you're basically talking about a cow that lives in water. You got to figure this is a critter that only eats plant life. He doesn't eat meat. It's not a predator. Uh, you know, he's going to eat tree bark and roots and stuff like that. That's a, that's the beaver, and a muskrat is just a small down version of it. Eats the same kind of stuff. Uh, so the good portion of of the beaver that I catch get butchered right after skinning. Uh, they get freezer packed and then they go into the freezer. Muskrat, same way, I do them, kind of split them up. I'll do some carcass, put them in freezer bags, and then you know they go in the crock pot and I'll cook them that way, and then some of the other ones I'll just pull the meat off of. Uh, but you know, a good portion of those get eaten because that's good quality meat. Um, you know, I have tried other things. If I can this winter, I'll get up some videos on, on recipes for that stuff. Uh, other critter, or other ways to carcass disposal. Um, and I, I've always said this for years, but dog food, plain and simple, is dog food. Uh, I've, I've always had dogs, uh, and to be quite honest, I do not buy dog food for about three and a half months out of the year. Cook it either way. Uh, for the most part, my dog just eats it, eats it raw. But uh, it's solid protein. It's ten times better than any dog food that you can buy in the store. And you know, in the past, whenever I'm running these hounds, you know, they're, that's the time of year that they're needing that protein. Uh, also, the fat. You guys can see I've got the wood stove going here. I burn almost, well, I do burn every bit of coon fat that I flesh out. Coon fat, beaver fat, all the fleshings get burned. That is solid, saves me so much firewood throughout a year. Uh, you know, it's incredible. It burns really, really hot. You actually have to be very careful whenever you load up a wood stove with the, the fat because it burns so hot. I don't do any kind of like bait piles or or anything like that here uh, in other states or something. You know that's definitely an option. But uh, for me, you know that's that's a good portion of what my carcasses go to. Uh, there, I, I eat a lot. A lot goes to dog food. You know, like I said, I'm using the the fat for fuel. Uh, 
you know, there's a lot of baits that I make. Uh, a lot of my canine bait is based off of beavers and muskrats. It's totally uh, understand everybody's questions about that because it can be intimidating, you know, if you're just getting into it and you're like, well, what do I do with all this? But uh, definitely, if you guys uh, haven't tried this, the kind of water critters, definitely give them a go. So, anyway, guys, I'm uh, just looking at the clock here. We've ran out of time today. I really hope uh, you guys enjoyed this second episode. Like I said, keep the comments and the questions coming. Uh, I I really appreciate everybody in the comments helping me answer some of the questions too. That's a big help. You know, we've got a great community here. Like I said, I I read I read all the comments, but it's it's almost impossible. Uh, this time of year, I'm getting upwards of of six to seven hundred comments a day throughout all my videos, and it's it's very hard to you know to reply to them all. So anyway, guys, I really appreciate the view. Um, for those of you that are interested, I still have a few a uh, little bit of merchandise left. I'll leave a link below to the website. You can pick that up. We've got hats, hoodies, and T-shirts. I think the hoodies are uh, the hats are. The hats are they're getting pretty low in stock, as are the hoodies. We've definitely got a lot of t-shirts left, though. So uh, I haven't really plugged that much in the last few videos. If you'd like to check those out, uh, please do. As you can see, I've got a mountain of fur that i got to go through tonight. So uh, I'm going to get on that. Until next week, guys, I appreciate it. Thank you for the view.